Part of my lab is involved in um, trying to make um, intelligent machines, and we're trying to do this in the only way that we know it works, namely by evolution. But I'll first show you what we want, what we have right now, basically, or what we want to achieve, and wh where we are, basically, not my lab, but other people. So what we want, of course, is this, right? Uh, that's the HAL 9000, and uh, it was supposed to be operational already in 1997, but that's obviously not happened. So in movies, AI is actually easy. Here you see a few of these examples, but in reality, we're actually stuck with stuff like this. <laughs> and uh, so what we do have is we have machines that play chess, and we have machines that play Jeopardy, and they do this all very well, and we have driving cars by Google. Um, but, you know, what would we really uh, like to achieve? Um, Certainly, playing chess in Jeopardy, I think most people will agree, is not intelligence. It is special purpose knowledge. It's kind of brute force with some heuristics, and uh, of course, Google's car has car driving intelligence, but we shouldn't ask it to play chess or Jeopardy, and of course, uh, nor should Watson be asked to drive a car. Um, so I want to introduce you to a classification of two types of intelligence. Uh, this type, what I like to call type one, is an intelligence that behaves appropriately given the environment. It has kind of all its answers ready. It has F, if X, then Y rules, and it's these kind of things. Uh, the kind that we really would like to have one day, I like to call type two intelligence. That's the kind that reasons about the environment. It understands, it predicts, and it plans. Um, and it is, of course, all of those types of intelligence that we, that we love and cherish. So, what does type one intelligence have? Well, first of all, we do have it, actually. I mean, we have achieved this, but I think type two intelligence, we have yet to achieve. And among the things that um, type one intelligence uh, has is, for example, we don't think that the kind of things that we have made have any free will. In fact, we don't want to have them any free will. Google's car, for example, being a typical example. Um, but apparently, these things that we have identified to have type 2 intelligence do have free will. Uh, so what is all, all this about? So in reactive machines, the actions are directly influenced by the, what the agent perceives. And in fact, in our brains, we still have those pathways. Uh, here's uh, uh, the brain, and there is its dorsal stream, uh, which is known as the where pathway, and that, in fact, is a pure, almost pure feed-forward pathway, and it connects directly to motor neurons, and that's pretty much this type one, you know, intelligence, at least for the visual uh, part. Um, type two actually has its own pathway. It has a what pathway, which has a lot of feedback uh, loops in it, and uh, seems to be also later evolutionarily, and this is apparently where the type two sits. And what's special about this? It is involved in recognition, and it uses memory. Memory is absolutely key to this. Uh, so it is in these what pathways that, that we uh, know uh, long-term stored representations are involved. What these things are, are internal models of the world that we are using to make decisions. And we can do those even with our eyes closed, with all senses closed, because they are actions based on internal states. And what I want to argue is that they are actually crucial to the, to the experience of free will. So what we do in my lab is um, embodied cognition. Uh, and so basically we do uh, robots that live in an environment, act on it, change it, and perceive stuff from it. Um, they are, they, these robots have brains that, uh, from a new type of brain that we devised uh, called hidden Markov machines. Uh, these are, and, and in these brains, these Markov networks, what happens is that these internal representations evolve. They're not being programmed, they literally evolve. Um, and uh, here's kind of a picture of, of how this works, but I don't have time to actually explain how it works. But basically all the, you know, what, these are logic gates, stochastic logic gates that connect inputs to outputs, uh, and how they connect and with, with what logic, all of that stuff is evolved. Um, so you can think of the, these things as neural networks on steroids, because in, in neural networks, you know, the connectivity does not change. Um, so how are these things evolved? Very quickly, we encode the connectivity and logic in genes. The expression of the genes creates a network, so we evolve the genes rather than the network. So here's an example for a brain that we evolved just to recognize handwritten digits, and it kind of looks like this after evolution is done, and we start with a completely random thing. Uh, so these are the sensors up there, uh, and here are logic gates, and here are the actuators that make the decisions. So all of these Markov brains in principle can learn 
Okay, they have the potential to change those firing probabilities that are genetically encoded at first, but they can also be changed by experience, and it can change the memory and the representation by every sensory experience. Okay, and as a consequence, um, if a brain that we evolved is presented with a stimulus, it can actually change the behavior. Makes a behavior, gets a new stimulus, and then it, Presented with the same stimulus again makes a different behavior, so it looks like it has free will. But if you actually take away this capacity to, um, to change your representations, to learn, then in fact they look dumb. They don't actually display free will. Now, this is only behavior, okay? But on the other hand, if I can't ask the person or the robot, then the only thing that I can evaluate as far as free will is concerned is behavior. However, there's also, in fact, um, some clinical evidence that give you the same type of uh, results. So there's a patient that was hospitalized and in fact had lost her short-term memory. Um, and what happens is that, you know, she had to go to the hospital, you know, every seven days or every four days, I forgot. And every time she um, goes into the hospital and sees the floor, she says the exact same sentence, namely, holy shit, these floors are so fancy for a hospital room. Every time. And if you would ask her, why do you say that? Well, I just felt like it. And it's like, do you, is, did you do that out of free will? And of course she said, yes, yes, that was my free will. But she does it every time the exact same way because you took away the memory. So we, you know, when we see this hospital floor for the second time, we change. We change our representation. We go, oh my God, I remember I already said that. I'd look stupid. Okay. So it turns out that, you know, you can have the appearance of free will and you can have the non-appearance free will even when the person believes they still has it. So, type 1 intelligence is easy to design but boring. There's no consciousness, no free will. Type 2 intelligence perhaps impossible to design, but we can evolve it. And it seems to have, first of all, increasing phi, you know, uh, Tononi phi, we measured it. It's a better corollary to fitness than, in fact, predictive information that we also heard about uh, as they become more fit. And, in fact, these type of things can look like they have free will if the machine can learn and remember. So I'm going to leave you with uh, my definition um, free will is a consequence of lived and remembered experience. And even an uh, android, like uh, this one out of um, uh, Blade. Blade Runner, um, you know, with a decision of free will, uh, can you know, tell you a very personal, intense story of free will, even though you know, being in a machine, you might think that such a machine could never display it.